this is a lovely image, um, a work down at um, Museum of Old and New Art. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, a projection on water coming down. What I love about this image is this whole combination of old and new and this idea of culture. I like the fact that it's got all these components, i.e. the water droplets um, that are in it. So, oh, keyboard. Today I'm going to uh, talk about data until it makes your hair curl. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, some of the technical side of, of linked data and talk about some of the formats um, that uh, linked data comes in. So these are the major concepts. And we had a bit of a chat this morning about what is metadata and what is data. And I wish I had a whiteboard. Um, so I will get to that and hope give some meaning to, to what the difference is between metadata and data. The important thing is to understand they're both data. It's just they, uh, they have different functions. What's a schema and what's an ontology? Um, and uh, I guess the, these are key elements of linked data that you kind of need to get your head around. And um, hopefully by the end of the session, you might have kind of got, got through some of that. And believe you me, it's taken me a long time to kind of tease this out. So if you manage to get it done in the afternoon, <coughs> then come on board, we need you. Um, so starting off, what is data? And I've got, I guess, some descriptions here about what data can be. And in the humanities, where we recognize data as really a, a mixed, mixed form of structured and unstructured information. And so it's not the kind of data that you have coming off sensors, where it's um, perhaps temperature readings or um, mostly numerical. It's incredibly heterogeneous. It's um, uh, meaningful to humans, often very, uh, in very immediate ways. Whereas, as you can see, those numbers are quite opaque. They're not really easy to access without a little bit more in the way of information around it. Um, it can be what we call alphanumeric, a mixture of, of letters and numbers. Um, it can be, as I've said, a narrative, um, and it can exist on its own. Like you can have a series of numbers, and that can exist. That's just data. But if you have metadata, which is data about the data, it can give a bit more meaning to those numbers. So they might be telephone numbers or your library card number. And the fact that I've used the word telephone number and library card number, that's the metadata. So it can be open, widely available for use or closed, and um, it can sometimes identify. Um, people, uh, works, and um, they can be identified uh, through a URL and um, found on the internet. So metadata, what is metadata? And I've just given a very basic example here, and it's the kind of thing that uh, if you've become accustomed to using spreadsheets or seeing tables, you're creating data and metadata. And so I've got the example here of uh, this idea of metadata having an aboutness in its nature. So um, the word gender, it tells you that uh, it's the aboutness of the word female. So there's lots of deeply philosophical thought about this, and I won't go into it. Um, but it gives you an idea of what the data was meaning to describe or reflect. And um, d uh, data in itself has a value. So we know that uh, the value of gender equals female. and uh, you can br bring it all together, I guess, and make a statement that the eye colour is blue. So there's this idea of a subject, um, an object, and perhaps a, a link between those two things. So it's kind of a sentence for me is implicit in the relationship between a piece of data and metadata because you're making a statement about something. My name is Ingrid. The name of Ingrid is mine. Schemas. Uh, we've heard about um, the schema called EAC CPF, and it's a schema that's used in the archival community. But there's schemas of all kinds. And I think what's really interesting for me as someone who's come from a community who has particular schemas, the library, museum, archive, gallery community, is being aware of all these other schemas that are used in the world. And there's this amazing visual um, representation of the kinds of schemas that are available in the different domains. And this reflects our encoding of culture, our encoding of practice, our encoding of information. So our schemas reflect the nature of what we're encoding. So MARC, which is the schema used in the library community, reflects the nature of bibliographic material. And this idea of the schema, EACCPF, this reflects the nature of archives, that archives are generated by people or by organisations. And so that schema um, has those characteristics in it, so it can capture that data effectively. Some of it becomes you know, highly formalised, and it ends up as an, an international standard. And I think I've got one there 
the standard for capturing spatial information and um, the geospatial folks, I uh, have to say, are just streets ahead and standardising and setting schemas. And there's this whole movement there which I'd love to know more about called the Earth Cube. Do you know about that? It's amazing. It's this idea of getting everybody around this idea of cutting up the globe so you can put a point down and find out all kinds of information based on that location. There's also a cultural project called History Pin. If you Google History Pin as a word, yep, nodding. It's again that idea of bringing lots of things together. <laughs> and uh, what I love about that is that things that we consider to be relatively neutral are actually really not neutral. We know that space and time uh, are relative, um, if you want to predict the philosophical, but um, they're there are often lots of really interesting things happen around them. So what happened in 1964 in this place? And you get all sorts of views about what, what had actually happened around this time and place. And um, so creating standards means that you can bring this material together, which is why I think keeping an eye on the geospatial folks is, for me, that's that kind of horizon that I keep looking for when I think of what's going to be the next um, you know, movement in terms of schemas. Moving on from that is this idea of a database, because if you want to pack all this data in together, you often have what I call a framework, which is this idea of a schema, and you want to uh, gather more than one, one stream of data. You want to, I don't know, capture all the names of the people in this room, so you'd set up a database potentially to do that, and maybe their email addresses. So what happens is you start to encode data, you start to impose a structure on it, and that in itself is a very, um, uh, I think, embedded in cultural process. And some of that is dictated by what you know how to do. And some of it is dictated by what it is that you're trying to encode. There's a really interesting relationship between data and actually how you arrange it. It's the same way that we have standards for paper. They're all designed, all our paper that we have has a history about why we ended up with it with the sizes that we have and the, the sizes that we have books. And it's the same with data to do with practices and the way that we become accustomed to doing things. And so I guess one of the uh, structures of data, um, aside a database where you will store data, is this idea of an ontology. And I had real difficulty getting my head around this concept because I've worked so much in the world of databases. I'm not a computer scientist and I didn't do philosophy. Um, but it's like being shoved in head first into this territory. But it's this idea of you have an, uh, an understanding of the higher principles or the higher ideas that are informing the way that you arrange things. So um, it's a very abstract term, but I'm hoping that I might make it a bit more tangible for you. So yes, data's, data needs to be put into a store and it's usually in the form of a database. And um, the way it's stored is quite important, or the way that it goes through. And Con talked about RDF as a format for data. We all know what CSV is. That's a format for capturing data, along with .tab. But data is also just you typing a document and saving it as a doc file. You've got data in there. And so .doc is a data format, but it's not tabulated data. It's actually data as a series of strings tacked on to each other, which we call, I guess, narrative. So the way you store it can actually have a real impact upon the way that you can exploit it. So when data's um, in a document, there are different things that you need to do to help get that data out. And there's lots of techniques that you can use to strip out information from that data. But it's a very different kind of process that you would undertake with stripping information out from a table, for example. So I've got some examples of, I guess, the, these models which have been developed to capture data. And the one that I became most familiar with when I first trod into this territory was the relational or hierarchical database, this idea of tables and capturing information in tables. And we've all used spreadsheets and spreadsheets are tables. So hopefully that's something that actually rings a bell with you. So I thought I would try and, uh, I guess, bring in this idea of how you encode data and what happens when you do that. So this is an example of a relational database. And what you do if you've got two tables and you want to join them together, you use something called a key. So you use that key as the kind of the bit, uh, the bit that unlocks the information so you can merge two tables together. And that's a process that's undertaken that I think, you know, it's a reasonably straightforward process. <laughs> 